Inglês ou português? Não, pode ser no inglês. Inglês. Pode ser? Sim, sim. Humble Market é uma combinação de coisas, principalmente cross disciplines. So it is a way of joining up the company's diverse interests. Um, there is my interest in the performer and the presence of the performers and the contact between the performer and the uh, audience. And there is Georges' interest in digital technology and um, creating pieces that can recreate intimacy without the necessity of of other people without using humans inside it and it, we, we've kind of come to the conclusion that that's an impossible task but somehow trying to do that it gives us lots of new possibilities of creating performances so it is a um, an, an installation, a digital installation that is interactive, that is performative. The artwork itself is interactive and the performers are interactive, so trying to create what you might call immersive environments, so the person feels quite immersed in, in the situation. In terms of the action, I call it constructed situations. So we try to construct a situation. So for example, there's the police and there's a siege on the taxi, you know, expressing the totality of who you are, which is uh, extremely limited and driven by consumerist desires. Eu sempre trabalho no grupos que realmente eles auto auto escolher, não? Uma coisa que a gente nunca fez uh, auditions, nunca fiz seleção assim, e aqui também eu nem fiz. We did a in, um, call out um, and lots of people came and we did some workshops and we played around and we showed the ideas and we showed some methodologies and then people naturally started to self-select. So um, we work with a lot of discipline, uh, there's a lot of attention on how we are in the group, whether or not we, how we, how we um, look after the space and turn up not just on time but actually before being on time um, to clean the floor and there's a lot of commitments, a lot of things you have to do to be able to be part of the part of the, the working methodology that, that we kind of follow. I, I, I guess there was something about looking for people that I felt weren't maybe not the most fantastic actor and the most fantastic mover or with the best voice but actually the people that understood the politics. Um, because I think if you don't understand the politics, you're just going to be confused <laughs> as an actor. You're not going to get it. So in the end, the people who were not quite as um, not quite cu comfortable with our approach, they sort of naturally fell away. And the people that stayed were the people that go, yes, this is important. We get what you're doing. It is subtle. It's not being an activist going on the street and kicking the bicycles down but at the same time it's it's a way of talking about what's happening now in the cup with the cup hmm. yeah so that was a big part of it so that store local is is um, each of the store locals has a has a kind of conversation one of them is you in society for example one of them is you in yourself your personality and this one is um, is you in the universe so it's your relationship to the universe. This includes all those big questions like uh, spirit, your spiritual beliefs and your religious beliefs. And there's a formation of around, generally, as philosophers, um, there's an assertion that there are really only 10 big questions. There are really only 10 big, and you can find millions of different ways and variations and nuances within those questions, but really there are only 10. And we played with these questions a little bit and they involve um, questions around God, questions about the universe, how big it is. You know, the more that we know about the universe, the more insignificant we must accept we are. And so this hill is really about dealing with that insignificance, uh, bringing it to the... Uh, insignificance is in the sense that um, what if really there's nothing after you're dead? And of course people, people bring up their belief systems and we examine those belief systems a little bit. Um, it's not to, you know, bully anybody and say, no, you're completely stupid, but it's also to understand why we have the necessity to 
have these strong, illogical, I could say without getting beaten up, illogical belief systems, but that I find they are very beautiful and very necessary and full of rituals and rites that help us live our lives. So, so those, so that, yeah, that's the area of hill, really insignificant. Back in the void, like Beckett said, in the waiting for Godot. It's such a beautiful phase that you feel yourself a speck in the void. In English, this is really nice. I haven't found a good translation. It represents the complete mix that the crazy mix that crazy Brazil is. This completely unashamed mixing of of um, idols and uh, symbols and now new age thought you know kind of esoteric new age everything asian lumped together in one thing um and of course the very strong violent meeting between catholicism indigenous beliefs and african beliefs this is like i mean it's hard really to even to, to underestimate, it's completely impossible to overestimate um, how many layers in Brazil there are in this area, just layers upon layers upon layers. Um, and somehow it kind of, people work, work itself out. There are people that happily mix being Catholic with some, you know, with some sort of Orishaya belief or believing in horoscopes, for example, and all this stuff. And um, and those are all belief systems. So the altar is representative, representing all of those belief systems that, that you see in Brazil. So the Intimatron is a way of us trying to find out how much you can push the relationship between man and um, machine. Um, can you have an honest conversation with a telephone, with a disembodied voice on the telephone? Can you, how much can you reveal? How many secrets? Uh, how far can you go? And these, that's, that's kind of one part really of the Intimatron. The other part is, is also exploring um, our, relate, our changing relationship with, with systems of automation, which are more and more in force now. So when you call the bank, you often get an automated person saying, if you would like this, press one, if you would like that. And I became really like fascinated with those, with those options because I was constantly frustrated that I don't want any of those things. I need this other thing that you're not giving me. And I, I really wanted to play with that thing of like frust frustration a little bit. And that's how it started, but then it evolved into something really quite meaningful. And I started to write a script, which was about, um, which was based on personality tests from the 50s and psychometric testing. And I wanted to ask people these questions, but really ask them. So not in a therapeutic setting, not because I wanted to sell them something, because usually those kinds of tests were used very strongly to, uh, to help people uh, develop big marketing strategies. And also uh, not to um, control you in the work setting, like psychometric testing really is about um, trying to get into the mind of people who are essentially just going to be laborers in a capitalistic setting, uh, how we can control them better uh, through their fundamental needs and desires. And I took all those kinds of questions and sort of inverted them a little bit in order to, for people to have an experience of meeting themselves on a telephone. You know, this experience of like having to think of questions that really you don't think about very often and hopefully open up a space mentally where you can start to have a different relationship with yourself. Yeah, for your experience, it's amazing. Uh, so it's been a very tricky time as you know there's been the strike uh, for Nashi actually where we're working is actually on strike <laughs> and we're uh, contradictory we're in support of their strike but at the same time we're still putting up the exhibition and 
Uh, there's the cup. So that all that nonsense is, is going on, all that fanfare. And there have been some demonstrations in Berga. Um, and in fact, on Thursday, I think when there was a big demonstration, we, we you know, gave the afternoon free for the actors, for people to go there and give their support. And we went as well, and it was, um, it was okay. It was very, it was very peaceful, it was very tranquil. I mean, it was, what I mean is that there was nothing really, we were just so paralyzed because the police are so powerful. And one of the things that was very important uh, I watched that. I, I didn't want to watch the football, but unfortunately, I really like football, and um, it was a real tension. And I, I went home. I said, "No, I'm not going to watch it." I went home. No, we went to a rest, a cafe, and it was on there. I thought, "Oh man, okay, I'm just going to watch the first half." <laughs> and then I thought, "It's just ridiculous. I'm going to end up watching it." So we watched it, and um, but then afterwards. Uh, Shaw showed me something on Facebook which was so horrible and it just made me feel really angry and really sick which was this uh, guy in Sao Paulo the police um, he was he was simply blocking the road but peacefully he had like a white vest top he, you could see that he had nothing on him he was you know totally unarmed completely harmless and the police were with the um, shock the shields, you know, those plastic shields, total riot gear, riot gear. And they pushed forward, and they went into him and they grabbed him and they got him on the floor and they held, you know, they held his head and they held his eyes open and they sprayed pepper spray in his eyes like this. It was really shocking. And it was really horrific. And I was so ashamed in a way that I'd watched the game because I thought while I was watching that game, that was what was happening outside. And, uh, mm, I don't know, it's just a big uh, tragedy, really. And it's, um, it's really bad for Brazil. And I don't know what's going to happen now. But, Part of this exhibition is about being critical of Brazil in that sense. This um, this idea of carnival and festa and be happy is all a, a bit about that masking. I want to unmask the idea that for a country to be this happy, they must be really sad. That's Me, so. <laughs> That's a hard question, Nacho. How much more Brazilian am I? Like from one year ago, all I know <laughs> is that uh, I don't want to go home. I don't want to go back to Europe. Um, <clears throat> I feel committed to Brazil. I believe in the concept of Dharma, and Dharma is a concept close to Karma. It's not Karma, but it's an idea that in, somewhere in the world there's your place somewhere that you belong, somewhere that you can be useful. You know, and I feel part of this discussion, my daughter's Brazilian, my husband's Brazilian. Um, I don't really believe in nationalities and, and borders, so I don't have a strong national identity about being British. I am, I have characteristics that are very British, but I'm also Arab, and I have characteristics that are very Arab, which sometimes chime with being Brazilian. I notice a lot of <laughs> sort of symmetry there. Um, but I don't know if I am more Brazilian because I don't really know what that means but because I, I, I think it doesn't really mean anything but I, I certainly feel at home here. Um, I suffer from, I have claustrophobia and I suffer from panic attacks and somehow here in Brazil that part of me um, is very calm. So my anxieties, panics, claustrophobia is really well controlled in Brazil. In London it tends to be a little bit more uh, at the front. So yes, I do like it here. I find myself very uh, comfortable. Comfortable.
I don't think I'm a new more Brazilian really. I think I'm just the same person. I'm very different. I still feel myself very different, but I think that that difference is nothing to do with nationality. I think that's just to do with me and my process.